Good afternoon, everyone. We are so happy to have you guys here. My name is Melinda Maynard Lowry. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of the American South. Um, I would like to first express my gratitude for the Okanichi people of North Carolina and the land that they still possess that we are on today. I would also like to express my gratitude to the College of Arts and Sciences, the to Patrick Horn, Associate Director of the Center for the Study of the American South, that has done so much to make today's event possible. I'm gonna ask our Chancellor, Kevin Guskowitz, to come give us a welcome. Great. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Melinda. <laughs> and uh, for, for, forgive me because I lost my voice uh, last week in Charlotte. And, uh, <laughs> But uh, we had a wonderful campaigns event, uh, campaign events there, and, but it was a wonderful few days there. So we're going to have a lot of fun tonight. And uh, I'm thrilled uh, to be here as the interim chancellor of uh, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and excited to be attending the Hutchins Conversation with uh, John Parrish uh, Pede, uh, chair of the National Endowment uh, for the Humanities, uh, along with our own uh, Bill Ferris, who I think, as you know, um, is our uh, most recent Grammy Award winner, uh, Bill Ferris. So, uh, and um, I think you know that, uh, that Bill also uh, chaired uh, the, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and uh, uh, we were thrilled that from that, from that assignment, he came to join us here in Chapel Hill. And uh, so uh, we're thrilled to be here again uh, with, with Melinda and uh, having the uh, Center for the Study of the American South uh, sponsor this event. And uh, uh, John, on behalf of UN the UNC community, uh, we want to welcome you to Carolina. Uh, it's an honor uh, to have you join us today. And Bill, thanks so much for all that you've done for Carolina. We'll continue to do for Carolina, especially for uh, the Center for the Study of the American South. Uh, as former Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and I want to acknowledge Terry Rhodes, who is the new Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, Terry, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, Terry, Terry and I take great pride uh, in uh, the work that our faculty and students are conducting uh, in this area of the study uh, of the American South. Uh, through our humanities programs, uh, through departments such as uh, American Studies, History, the English Department, and um, our Religious Studies Department, uh, along with the Center, uh, we are uh, really considered uh, a national leader in understanding uh, a diverse and changing South. Uh, UNC historians and researchers are providing important context uh, and cultural perspectives on so many issues that our country is facing today, uh, from what to do with Confederate monuments, uh, to how the meaning of Southern food has shifted, to how influxes in immigrants are reshaping the rural South. We're committed uh, to not just continuing Southern studies here at Carolina, but advancing it and investing in these critical studies like we like, we like to say here in Chapel Hill, is that we own the study of the American South. In fact, we like to talk about Synergy Unleashed, which is the bridging of the sciences, the, the, the social sciences, uh, the fine arts and the humanities, and the campaign for Carolina, uh, which we're in the middle of a, of a, uh, a large campaign, uh, kicked off uh, last October with uh, this initiative being one of those featured initiatives. We also, uh, my work in the area of neuroscience uh, brought together uh, the humanities and uh, NASCAR and uh, the Center for the Study of the American South uh, just 10 days ago when we hosted a, in a partnership with uh, Melinda who happened to uh, have a connection to Dale Earnhardt Jr. Uh -huh. uh, and we hosted our uh, biennial uh, Gefeller Concussion Symposium uh, and we were able to bring Dale here uh, to talk about his experience with concussions in NASCAR and a, and a wonderful Synergy Unleashed approach of uh, the Center for the Study of the American South and uh, our work that we're doing in concussion. I do believe that this Synergy Unleashed approach is really what uh, will lead us to become the leading global public research university uh, in the nation that we aspire uh, to be. Here we talk about being uh, deeply committed to the excellence in teaching, advancing global research, and being passionately public. Uh, we talk about being not only the first of the public institutions, but the most public of the public. 
So I'd like to thank uh, Melinda Maynard Lowry and Patrick Horn, Director and Associate Director for the Center, uh, for their tireless work and leadership in, uh, of, of CSAS. And also like to thank the co-sponsors, including the Institute for Arts and Humanities, where we are today, the Carolina Public Humanities, uh, the Humanities for the Public Good, and the North Carolina Humanities Council. And I know that we have representation from all of those uh, here uh, this afternoon. So thank you for, uh, for all of your uh, contributions to this. And I'd also like to thank and recognize Congressman David Price, uh, uh, who's here with his wife, Lisa Price. Thank you. Thank, thank you for being here, as well as Dr. Robert Newman, uh, Director of the National Humanities Center. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, so with that, um, uh, we want to thank you all for being here. I think we're going to have a lot of fun with, with John and Bill. And uh, with that, I think we're turning it over to, to you. Or actually, Melinda. We're turning it over to Melinda. Thank you. We're going to definitely hear from these gentlemen in a minute, but I want to make sure everybody understands the scope of their contributions and their relationship, which is phenomenal. John and his staff have been on campus for a day and a half now, providing incredible grant funding workshops, meeting with humanities leaders, uh, humanities grant recipients here on campus. and. Um, he is really fulfilling a role at, that we're extremely proud of as a Southern University serving in a national and global capacity. Since 2018, John Peaty has been the chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities. His previous positions include publisher of the Virginia Quarterly Review, or VQR, at the University of Virginia. And under his leadership, VQR expanded its paid readership to 51 countries. He acquired work from seven Pulitzer Prize winners and edited interviews with two Nobel laureates. Prior to joining VQR, Chairman Petey served in a variety of capacities at the National Endowment for the Arts. All of these positions are presidentially appointed, where he served as literature grants director, counselor to NEA chairman Dana Joya, and director of various NEA programs, including Operation Homecoming, writing the wartime experience. For seven years, he led writing workshops for US troops in Afghanistan, Bahrain, <coughs> England, Italy, Kyrgyzstan, the Persian Gulf, and on domestic bases. He's a writer and editor whose work includes academic presses and speeches for a US president, a first lady, and a librarian of Congress. He is the co-editor of Inside the Church of Flannery O'Connor, Sacrament, Sacramental, and the Sacred in her fiction and the editor of a bilingual anthology of contemporary American fiction. <coughs> he served on several nonprofit boards, including the National Council of, Mar of the Margaret Walker Center for the Study of African American Experience at Jackson State University. Chairman Petey holds a bachelor's degree in English from Vanderbilt and a master's in Southern Studies from Ole Miss. And of course, it was at Ole Miss that <coughs> Chairman Petey met and studied with the man who would hold that seat before him, William R. Ferris. Bill Ferris became chairman of the NEH in 2007 between, and stayed in that position until 2001. Prior to his appointment at the NEH, his scholarship focused on Southern African American folklore and culture through a variety of media, print, sound, film, and photography. He has received numerous awards and fellowships, most recently, of course, those two Grammys, not just one, two Grammys, <laughs> for Best Historical <laughs> Album and Best Liner Notes for a compilation of his life's work, Voices of Mississippi, produced by the Atlanta-based Dust to Digital. <laughs> Ferris has written and edited 10 books and created 15 documentary films. He co-edited the Pulitzer Prize-nominated Encyclopedia of Southern Culture, which contains entries on every aspect of Southern culture and is widely recognized as a major reference work linking popular folk and academic writing. His service at the NEH followed his appointment as professor of anthropology and founding director of the Center for Study of Southern Cultures at the University of Mississippi. In 2018, Profer Professor Ferris retired from UNC Chapel Hill after 16 years as the Joel R. Williamson Professor of Southern Studies and senior associate director of our center, the Study of the American South. This year, 2019, we are celebrating the year of Bill. Uh, we have a wonderful exhibit at our center of civil rights photographs that Bill curated. We are 
pleased to host this conversation between NEH chairman, past and present. And we're just so thankful for both of you being here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, this is really, it's like an extended family because all of you are old and new friends and what an honor to have a true star, former student whose brilliant career I've followed carefully and with great pride. John Peaty, as Melinda has eloquently described, has had quite a productive career in a short few years, uh, all of which is drenched in both the humanities and the arts. He is eminently qualified to chair the National Endowment for the Humanities in this time in our lives. And I thought the best way to begin would be to turn to John and ask him what is your vision and what kind of things you see coming and kind of lay the foundation of the future which we are all deeply invested and supportive of. And I also want to acknowledge David Price who is the eloquent voice for the humanities on the hill. Thank you David for your leadership. Yeah. And I would like also to acknowledge uh, Rule Tyson, without whose great leadership in the humanities, we would not be sitting here today. Uh, he embodies the public humanities and all that we believe in so deeply. I also want to acknowledge uh, Vincent Rydell and Anne Ridici. Anne did her PhD here, and they are both on the staff of the chairman. And would you please rise and be acknowledged? Here, here. <laughs> John, I'm going to turn it over to you. Sure. Well, what a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, and I want to uh, second that uh, when we're trying to make the case about the value of the humanities, the society, to the nation and to the arts, the value of museums and libraries, uh, to be able to talk uh, w with the congressman, with Congressman Price, and not only the congressman, but his staff, that they get it. Uh, on the Hill, to organize the Humanities Caucus, uh, it, it requires staff time. And so the leadership isn't just what the congressman stands for, it's what he says to his staff, this is what I, I expect of you, and of course, uh, for them, it's not an assignment, but it's a passion. So thank you, and thank you for taking the time for, to be here. Uh, I, uh, if I hadn't overstayed at every stop on campus, I was going to look up something, which is an exact quote from Flannery O'Connor, uh, but now I'm going to have to wing it, and since I'm being taped, I'll say this is a paraphrase, but in, in doing this uh, with, with a mentor, uh, a friend, uh, somebody who shaped my life, uh, uh, somebody who I love. Uh, I'm reminded when Flannery O'Connor was asked about Faulkner and the idea of how do you write in the, in, in the shadow of Faulkner, and, and I can say that uh, her, her quote is, uh, when you're on the tracks and the Dixie Limited is coming down, you get your horse and buggy off the tracks. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to uh, talk from the point of view of the horse and buggy and the uh, and I think, you know, you're, when you're with your mentor, uh, there's always uh, a hierarchy, even if the mentor doesn't feel that way. Uh, but then when your mentor goes out and wins two Grammys, that's, <laughs> that's just a bit much, you know. Uh, and, uh, but it is, a, it is a pleasure to be here. And I, I might uh, say a few things. Uh, I'll say a little bit about where we are in the endowment. Um, and then hopefully we'll have a bit of a conversation back and forth. And then I know there's uh, time for, for the questions. Part of where the endowments are, I can, I can say about the kind of careers we had and that if the National Endowment for the Humanities is functioning in the right way, it allows for both of these careers. Bill's incredible career of going out and interviewing people before there was even organized academic disciplines to do that. He just knew that these stories needed to be captured and recorded. Uh, 
And then he received degree after degree and worked as a tenured professor at some great institutions and created a formalized Southern Studies program. And that's what I applied to after Vanderbilt. I took off about three or four weeks between undergrad and grad school and a little less than two years later I was, you know, I was out of grad school and into my first job. And ever since then I had to make up that career. I was a university press book publisher, then a magazine publisher, then I started a publishing house and then a became a speech writer, and then I did veterans projects. And every one of these was a version of telling stories. Different platforms, different genres, different mediums, decades went by, but it was always being a Southern storyteller. And we should have room for the nonprofit career. Um, sometimes we talk about success in the academy as whether a professor produced another professor. What I appreciate about what Bill did, in some ways the secret of that program, and maybe what is trying to be done here with the Institute here, is that the public humanities, the applied humanities, can give shape in lots of ways. In the classroom, yes, but also our museums, uh, our, our, our cultural centers. Um, and I think that we need that more than ever. Um, I, I think we should be just as proud to produce somebody that does documentary films or is a K-12 teacher as we should a, another faculty member. And so in terms of where the endowment is, uh, what I have said as chairman and what Congress uh, said in the dialogue we have is that um, we believe that civic engagement is important. Uh, that we believe the state humanities uh, councils are an anchor important part of our communities. Uh, in terms of the appropriation, Congress has noted that while it's not a large part of our budget, support for veterans programming is important. Also, support for Native American, Native Alaskan, Native uh, Pacific Islanders, uh, indigenous languages, that this is an important part of what the endowment does. Again, not necessarily as big a part of our budget as research, as education, as public programming. And uh, when we recognize uh, Anne Redici, uh, one way that she's known to a lot of you is that in the Bush and Obama administration, she was head of the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And to have a Senate-confirmed person on your staff, one of the things that I look to is to look to somebody such as Bill and Ann, people that know a lot more than I do in some areas, and try to have enough wisdom to listen. And so uh, a lot of what we're doing now is, is having some level of continuity, but also uh, having our eyes open that we're at a, I would say we're at a tipping point. This young generation needs to understand what this government was in its establishment. Why it took Frederick Douglass, why it took the 19th Amendment, why it took Martin Luther King to in many ways perfect those ideals because they might have been properly stated on paper for the most part, uh, but they did not recognize what we meant when we said all are created equal. So the endowment, uh, as investment in presidential papers and, and great thinkers, uh, cutting edge research, uh, that's, that's vital. But a lot of it I go back to, to the classroom and we talked at great level about uh, what might have been then called high and low culture. But it's all just culture. Mm -hmm. You know, the, outside of academic departments, <coughs> there really aren't lines in our lives between the arts and the humanities. And I think that's something that I, I learned from you. And, and lastly, uh, and I'll start a dialogue here, is one of the many things I took away from you is, is Bill always understood how to elevate oral culture. Now I'm somebody who's trained at Vanderbilt, very British system, American literature, Robert Penn Warren, C. Van Woodward, um, and so I love that part and, and the traditional <coughs> written text. And I loved it through Homer, which is to say I loved <coughs> oral culture. Because if you have Homer, if you have a Bible, if you have this, you love oral culture whether you know it or not. And that means if you're committed to inclusion of society, then if you're not committed to oral culture, you're often not fully committed to indigenous voices or, or African American voices because those voices were not often written down. Uh, so Bill did an immense uh, and wonderful thing to the endowment when he said that oral culture is a field of the humanities equal to any other area of research. And that's something that is echoed in my chairmanship and maybe revisited in my chairmanship. So uh, with that, uh, 
two Mississippians, I expect we'll have <laughs> one exchange and then say goodnight, but, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to you and I'll return some, some ideas. Well, Patrick Horn gave us a sort of checklist of questions, <clears throat> the first of which was the political issues. There are always political figures who, unlike our beloved David Price, don't think the humanities should even exist. And when I first went to Washington, my dear friend Bill Friday came up <coughs> and he said, I want to introduce you to Jesse Helms. I want to make sure you get off on the right leg because he had wanted to destroy both endowments. So we went over and met with Congressman Helms and I always took an inscribed copy of the Encyclopedia of Southern Culture, which UNC Press published. And he was pleased with that. We talked about country music. And then he said, how do you get along with Cudden Trent? Well, that was Trent Lott, the majority whip Republican from Mississippi who had put me up there. And I said, we get along fine. So he said, let's go see Cudden Trent. So we go down the hall. He's on his walker. Bill is on a cane. And we go in and Trent Lott comes out straightening up his tie and says, what can I do for you? And Jesse Helm says, do you know this Ferris guy? He says, oh yes, we got his encyclopedia right here. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a kind of example, and this was the first time a chairman had ever gone to these offices personally. And uh, politics was irrelevant. We talked country music. If I was going to <coughs> Senator Ben Lighthorse, uh, we talked auctioning, because I figured I looked and he had been an auctioneer. So you reach them below the troubled waters of politics and my father always said, you can always learn a lesson from each person whom you meet in life. And you look to them as people who are <coughs> interesting and have a, a lesson to teach you. And that's how John Petey has approached the endowment. I don't know the details of his day-to-day -day life, but I can see from his success that he is moving through these troubled waters underneath the turbulence and reaching them in things like uh, the, the military. We all want to support the military and respect them. I say we all want education. We want our children and grandchildren to have a better future. And we want to respect our own family. We'd like for their history to be known. It doesn't matter who you are, that's gonna touch you. And that's where the humanities touch the, the road. And the State Humanities Council are really the powerful vehicles for carrying the humanities into ev every community in North Carolina and in every state. So there is a legacy there. When Lyndon Johnson established the endowments, he said this is to carry the humanities and the arts to the American people. And no one does that better than John Petey. He knows the elite university academic worlds, but he also understands the people on the street. And we have to embrace that. We only have to look at the divisions within our nation to know that we are in deep trouble the divisions of wealth and power uh, between haves and have-nots has to be addressed in our nation and globally. And the humanities are a powerful vehicle for doing that. And to the degree that you understand that, you will do well. And I say that John Petey does it better than anyone before. Thank you. Uh, well. Um, I don't know what to say that, but I'm clearly buying dinner. So I think uh, uh, um, I I will say I, I will say we're a very southern audience here, and I will say there's something about the South and our commitment to community, um, our, our our tolerance of a range of 
of, of respectives in our communities, our families, it <laughs> makes, I, I think, naturally leads us to something such as the endowment. And uh, uh, Bill was an important mentor to me and in, in, in a way introduced me to my other significant uh, life mentor, Dana Joya, who, who of course was chairman of the Arts Endowment. And the first time I was staffing the chairman in 2003 or in going to the Hill, um, we were ultimately going to end up with, with Tom DeLay's uh, staff. It was still kind of the end of the culture wars and, and they were not uh, fond of our endeavor, I think it's fair to say. And, and Chairman Joya said to me, he said, so John, uh, there are only two kinds of people in this building, our friends and our future friends. <laughs> and you know, he, he said, if you don't get this, you don't work for me. And, and I got that. Now, I, you know, I say, I'm still meeting with some future friends 15 years later. <laughs> but you know, the thing is about the future friends is they made me clarify the message because these are tax dollars. These are, Bill and I are both from rural Mississippi. These dollars matter. Uh, uh, there are real needs in our society for our schools, uh, for, for education, for social security. And so I, I look at the responsibility we have about our catalytic investment is that that's my responsibility. And that if I, you know, if I can't make a case, uh, then I should change what we're doing, or, or there should be somebody else trying to make that case. So, I, and I look at that as uh, as an outgrowth uh, of uh, of the kind of education we had mm -hmm. and the kind of society we hope to have, and to, and to realize as Southerners that a lot of times we're trying to uh, reckon with our past, and two things came to mind in the last uh, year and a half. Uh, uh, Bill, uh, as a scholar, uh, helped lay the groundwork for so many, many th things. And one of them is how Mississippi went about celebrating its bicentennial. And that turned out to be twin museums, the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum and the Mississippi History Museum. And uh, when we're on that stage uh, of all of us, uh, various U US senators and members of Congress, uh, <coughs> that were there, Merle ever stood up and, and a few miles from where her husband had been assassinated in Jackson, Mississippi. And she talked about this building being an act of atonement. Mm -hmm. The most the state of Mississippi had ever put in a building, a structure, this is a building of the Capitol. And that symbolism is, is not by accident. And, uh, and you can reckon with, with history in a particular way. Uh, a colleague and I were in Oklahoma City and it was a few, about three weeks ago, and it was in the rain, in the night fog, and we're walking the Oklahoma City uh, Memorial and Museum. And it's the outline, of course, of where the building was before the bombing. And you have that flat uh, black stone, and there are all these small chairs here, or, or larger chairs, and then the smaller ones. The smaller chairs are those children who are in daycare. And you look across all that, and there's the big American elm tree, survivor tree. And, and when I think about those places, and the survivors of 9-11 will come to Survivor Tree on their date, and, and those from Oklahoma City often go to 9-11. To and so we have a, the idea that some things are so hard to wrestle with in our past that is the humanities. It is libraries, it is filmmaking, it is museums. It is how we reckon with it. And as, as much as anything, uh, that's something I, I, I learned from Bill and from others. I look across my other former professor, Tom Rankin, who's at the Center for Documentary Studies. Uh, by our, our, our uh, colleague um, from grad school, Lynn McKnight, is here. And we spent a lot of time not washing over our history. You know, clearly on this, this campus and the state, we've had a lot of conversation about how do you talk about history and, and contentious history. And for starters, you don't do it uh, without having a commitment to the local community having a voice. That means all people. And the humanities help us go through uh, divisive matters in a uh, a fair and uh, and uh, 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 fair manner, and so I've seen time and time again across the country that as the humanities are at the forefront of of addressing a lot of these issues. Uh, when uh, the um, it, when we, we've heard today in our interactions from the interim chancellor and the interim president, and uh, both had noted uh, the idea of global research has been said here. And uh, I sometimes go back to something that Zornel Hurston said, great folklorist, great novelist, of course. And Zornel Hurston said, research is formalized curiosity. 
And so that's what we're in the business in. We're in the business of curiosity. And uh, uh, that's been, the, I think, the great pleasure of, of my career. And I know it seems like we live in deeply divisive times, but I tell you, I go from members of Congress to members of Congress, and you can't tell on a lot of topics which party it is or a House or the Senate. There are any number of things that do unite people uh, across parties, and um, I'm happy to say the humanities are one of those great linking uh, matters. Yeah, you know, I, I think local and global <clears throat> is a trope. We all want to be grounded, but we also want to be global in a great university. And nothing is more local or more global than the human voice and a great story. Uh, and often those great stories inspire great fiction, like the adventures of Huckleberry Finn. There's no novel more beloved both locally in communities and globally, and embedded within it is the story of our nation, both the hopes and the fears, the issues of race, and breaking the rules to follow your heart rather than your head, as Huck does. So when we look, you know, we brought B.B. King to NEH. It was a historic moment. And he came into the biggest room, bigger than this, it was packed with people from both NEH and NEA and the staff who worked at the old post office. And it was a truly moving experience. B.B. probably was in school for a couple of years. He always apologized, saying, Bill, I, I never had an education, but I want blues to be taught in mm -hmm. school. And today, thanks to his library, which is now part of the Blues Archive, mm -hmm. blues is taught all over the world. And it's a voice of a people and a person like B.B., but it's also all our voices. <coughs> I'm sitting here all alone in a one-room country shack. My woman has left me and won't be back. It's a powerful image of loneliness, isolation, and we've all been there. So it speaks a voice that touches you. And it's that kind of magic connectivity that the humanities do. And I never really when I was in Washington, at any point in my life, divided humanities and arts mm -hmm. because they are one. They are the core of who we are individually and as a nation. And they are the most beloved parts of our legacy. Wherever you travel in this globe, people know and love Twain, the Blues, Faulkner, we handle the crown jewels when we talk about the humanities. And John is charged with the keeper of the crown jewels. And the budget, as he and David know, is what I call a widow's might. <laughs> 160, 70 million, 150, somewhere in there. I argued for a cultural czar at the cabinet level who would argue for budgets for the cultural agencies, the endowments, Library of Congress, Smithsonian, National Archives. This should be a multi-billion dollar commitment annually that we have. Imagine what that would do to libraries and schools and public television. I met the uh, Minister of Culture from Italy, and she said, in Italy, culture is like oil in Saudi Arabia. We fund it, and we fund it generously, and we wonder why your country is so pecunious, so <laughs> tight, because this is the richest thing we have in terms of uh, our foreign affairs, 
Uh, you go with a library in hand and everyone will love you. It's the least expensive and the most powerful way of making friends. And the endowment for the humanities is really the anchor of these stories. And to the degree that we weave them all together, both written and oral, then we have a kind of patchwork quilt that we can pull across our bed as Americans and know that we're going to be kept secure. Um, I agree heartedly about the value of the humanities to, to a, a society as a, as a foundational uh, uh, necessity. Um, you, you can see how hard Bill's made it for all the other chairmen who didn't bring B.B. King in. <laughs> uh, and, and if I invite any of you there to come give a lecture to the staff, that is what the expect, expectation of performance, just, just so you know. Uh, but uh, uh, I think one of the, uh, the real challenges for the endowment is how to draw the line between when to be catalytic in your investment and when to be transformative. And uh, so we have grants as small as $6,000. We have grants as large as a million dollars or multi-year grants uh, in the multi-millions. And uh, I question that, particularly some of the smaller grants. And, uh, and, and the staff made a good case why sometimes all a local history center needs is a curator to come in for two days or three days to make an assessment and write something. And fine, we'll continue to do hundreds and hundreds of those. And we'll do that in a courthouse in Kentucky, and they think they have two centuries of marriage licenses. And they do have two centuries of marriage licenses. We'll say, separate some of the older ones through acid-free paper, that's fine. And then, we'll, and then the curator that comes in will say, that last one whose name is Boone, that, that, land, uh, that, that, that land document, I, I think you might want to do something different with that one. Um, and then that's a, diff and that's a large, uh, more aggressive grant. And, uh, and the kind of conversations we've had today, uh, we had great ones in the, in the library here, about uh, 20, 30 years ago we talked about pres preserving projects. And, and then you had Bill as a Pied Piper and others out there saying, we need to have films and, and oral histories, and we, we need to not only document, but we need to present. Where, where we're going now is to document, to present, but also to work on discoverability. If you, if you have it on a website that no one can get to because it's not tagged, the little writings at the bottom, meta tags we call them, and what are those, what are those meta tags? Uh, for my generation, if it was about the Civil War, we would have said slaves. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're being educated on this campus, you're gonna say enslaved people. Uh, you're gonna have the relationship more clarified. Well, even changing all that uh, takes real time, takes real money. Uh, means the institution has to focus on this in some ways. So we're spending uh, a lot of time looking at how we do this. The, the Humanities Endowment and the National Science Foundation have worked together for decades on something called DEL, Documenting Endangered Languages. But what I also love is that we're at Crow Agency Montana where we're working on language revitalization. That's the last uh, federally designated tribal uh, group that, uh, that is able to conduct all this business in its native language. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the seven reservations uh, in Montana, it's about the size of Rhode Island. And, uh, and it says something special about the Humanities Endowment and how it's been led over the decades that uh, this, this last year when they wanted to commemorate the 1868 treaty, uh, the breaching of which ultimately led cu uh, to, to Custard's uh, uh, death there, uh, which is on the hill uh, above the college, uh, that the Humanities Endowment was the one federal institution invited who showed. Others sent remarks, and I know people are, are busy, the NEH is the one who shows up. And uh, to represent the federal government um, on land and the, talking about something that uh, by every historical measure is considered a, gen a genocide. Uh, and for them to say, we want, as chairman, we want you to walk in, in the ceremonial entrance with us. That that's how we feel about how this agency goes about its, its, its uh, business. Um, that's something I'm proud of, and uh, the 140 colleagues I work with. Uh, we had our, uh, 
our funding meeting last week. Uh, they, write, they do all the write-ups usually Christmas week to the first few weeks of January. Uh, we, we were closed in that time, so they did in a matter of days what we, we you'd normally do in weeks and we didn't miss uh, this because they didn't want to miss the opportunity to get the funds out the door. So, uh, so part of what I, I, I love about my colleagues is um, uh, they're public servants and, and they take the idea of serving their, their fellow <coughs> Americans very seriously and that ethos does get handed off from, from chair to chair across administrations. Uh, uh, we all have our own priorities, but, but it's locked in into the DNA of the endowments. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's, uh, uh, I know, uh, I think I've worked with seven of the chairman of the two endowments, and uh, uh, starting from Bill Ford, and, uh, and that's something that's very much rooted in it. So it may not be structured in the way a minister of culture is, and I don't, you know, I'm not allowed to weigh in on such uh, ideas, but, uh, but what I can say from the Librarian of Congress to the, to the Archivist of the United States, to all of us, uh, the head of Smithsonian, that, that we are trying to do the best we can to uh, complement each other's activities. And uh, one focus of the endowment now is, is Congress has uh, created a commission on the 250th, and we're spending a lot of time talking about grant making between now and 2026. Uh, some of this will be talking about we've all, what we've always done, We've been funding presidential papers. We already funded the 19th Amendment film that'll be on PBS. But then to say local communities, it's been a century since the women's right to vote. What stories are you saying here? What stories could you be saying here? Uh, to make it a local <coughs> story. And, um, and even in the decentralized way of all these federal sister agencies, um, I think we're, uh, we have the potential to achieve some of the things a, a Ministry of Culture would. But, uh, I did read that op-ed of yours with interest, and I think I have to leave it at that. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but that through line about how you value a nation's history, uh, uh, that's so compelling and, and, and so true. Yeah, yeah my, my mantra was that Americans need to know about America. We live in Chapel Hill, I have worked since coming here at the Love House, but when we renovated that, thanks to James Meeser, uh, we had to do a dig outside. <clears throat> and they turned up artifacts that went back to the first chancellor, then to the Civil War, then to native artifacts. Mm -hmm. So that building was living on several thousand years of history. And we simply need to know more about our own places of dwelling. And <clears throat> that is what the endowment does so well, mm -hmm. both nationally and through its state councils. It helps us know who we are as human beings living in a place. And sense of place in the American South is so important. And we are honored to have the extraordinary leadership of Elaine Westbrook uh, and Maria Estorino in our libraries here, <clears throat> which are the keeper of the, the treasures of the American South. And those treasures are rapidly expanding in terms of collections. They are rapidly being accessed online, thanks to NEH and Andrew Mellon and other foundations we're on the cutting edge of offering manuscripts and sound <coughs> recordings and films through the internet. And NEH has been on the cutting edge of that. And I'm just thrilled at what John Peaty and Brett Bobley, who is sort of the point person on that, are doing at NEH. And you might want to talk about where that's headed. Sure, absolutely. And then um, I think somebody yes. gave us a verbal cue when you want to open to the audience, but uh, uh, the Office of, of Digital Humanities, and it, uh, <coughs> Bill laid the groundwork for it. It might have been, a, it might have officially become an office a, a, a few years later, but, but from the director to the concept of it, the idea that digital humanities 
is separate in some ways from, from the other disciplines. Uh, that's something that the agency's really been a leader on and, and an anchor leader on. It has its own line item of, of funding from Congress. And the digital humanities for us is where we're primarily investing in an advancement. The idea that you create a technology or something that moves the entire field forward. So there might have been a time when we were working together, being educated, that just um, OCR, flatbed scanning, the idea of, uh, of uh, taking, uh, uh, scanning a document and having it available uh, for voice activated reading or any of these type of <coughs> ideas was as far as technology was. And then the internet came along and there would have been a time where that was an advancement. And so every time that what was an advancement becomes normal run-of-the-mill <laughs> preservation, then that moves to preservation access or public programs or the research division. So uh, our Office of Digital H Humanities is by its very nature about new technologies, about new movements, about new ideas. And so that means that the endowment is almost always in front of where museum culture might be or the academy might be. And that is hard to maintain a federal, we're modest size, but still a federal bureaucracy, and yet we're on the cutting edge of, of advancing and kind of codifying uh, uh, what among many competing styles of, of knowledge transfer, which ones are the best ones to invest in. And that is an area where the arts endowment and the, and the sciences work together. We have certain partnerships, for example, even with the NIH, um, in terms of how we think about federal investment in culture and how do we incentivize uh, certain areas of focus, uh, in, in that case, the medical humanities. Uh, but that's, that's something that's, that's continued, and uh, by its very nature, uh, it can be complicated to the applicants because they'll come to us and they'll say, we think this is digital humanities, and we'll say, no, no, that's just taking a reel-to-reel -reel tape, digitizing it, putting it on the web. That's just straight preservation to us. That's every day of the week to us. And the great thing about it is that doesn't mean they get turned down. It means that they say, no, you need to talk to my colleague in this division. And, and I can't say enough about the grant workshops we have here. Mm -hmm. And two of my colleagues uh, uh, that were leading the grant workshops, I don't know if they're in the back. Uh, I have bifocal, so I can't quite see. I saw a, a hand in the very back. But one of the things they're doing here, and we're going across the country, is to, to make sure that people understand exactly where those lines are between the divisions. Um, but, uh, but when our staff picks up the phone, whoever's on the other side of the phone, we work for that person. And we do so gladly. And, and that's also the culture of the endowment. One footnote to that, and then we'll open to questions, is to acknowledge Bill Andrews, who's one of the pioneers of digital humanities here. Bill's website, which was a poster child decades ago for slave biographies, autobiographies from Frederick Douglass to Harriet Jacobs, there are probably a hundred or more, are all online. You can read and you can see the original page and read the text. <coughs> <clears throat> and do a search for the word banjo <clears throat> or any topic or religion and go through this enormous body of material and find work in seconds. This is what digital humanities allows you to do. You don't have to physically visit Wilson Library and look at a manuscript. Uh, so we're living in a bold new world. But stories will always matter. It will always come back to that fundamental, the old verities, as Faulkner said. But I think we should open this. This is a rare opportunity to be in the presence of the chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And as you've heard, he is an eloquent voice for who we are in this room. So let's take questions. Yes. I've recently retired from the School of Dentistry here on this campus, and um, over the past few years, the changes in our government structure, particularly our state legislature, um, called into question whether 
our school and even more importantly the university itself, we continue to receive the funding support that the legislature had historically always provided for this liberal arts college. Um, in looking at that, we found at least our school was, was really only receiving funding from them about 25% of our total budget. And so we had alumni contributions, we had federal grants, and a fourth source that's skipped my memory right now. But, but can you speak a little bit about what does happen? Is it all federal funding? What, what else keeps it going? And could some of those others, like a Harvard, which has an endowment per student 20 times or more what it is for a UNC student, um, which perturbed me a little bit, but I understand their history. Um, but perhaps some of these other funding mechanisms um, could make that paltry uh, <laughs> widow's might <laughs> be uh, irrelevant. Well, uh, so if we look at the, the larger <laughs> thing about um, operational budgets for higher education across America, and, and if we take it, for example, if we set aside maybe uh, the professional schools, uh, uh, and look at undergraduate and, and, and graduate education. Um, uh, I think from the point of view of the endowment, um, ours is going to be largely project-based. In other words, we're not at any time looked at as we're going to write a check toward 1% of the philosophy departments across, you know, institutions ranked this way or, or all community colleges. So ours is always going to be project-based. Now, I, I, I think that actually makes sense because we want to incentivize best practices. Uh, something that's continued under my chairmanship, uh, Chairman Adams, the chairman immediately before me, Bro Adams uh, was committed to community college funding, and I think that's important. There are more students in America that experience community, uh, the humanities through community colleges than all the four-year institutions combined. Mm -hmm. um, I think the larger question, and, and I can't weigh into any particular state, uh, uh, but uh, the social contract that, that uh, we looked at as part of what we did with our public dollars at state level was we invested in higher education. Um, that's clearly broken down and, and, uh, and uh, we had, when I was at the University of Virginia, a lot of conversations when the state funding had reached, I think, 11% or 12%. Uh, did the, the state still have the right to every single board appointment at the institution? I think those kind of conversations are going to continue to be had uh, increasingly. Um, it's very rare for an institution to try to break <coughs> away from the state, but even such extreme conversations, you know, and I call that extreme because it's legally uh, a difficult thing to do. I think um, for the most part, uh, uh, there was a time we could talk about this is a duty. This is a duty to everybody who's within your state, is that you provide first tier. Uh, uh, access to higher education in, in the K-12. I think um, we have to be more sophisticated in that conversation. Um, yes, it's a duty, but, uh, uh, but we need to talk about the economic advantages. I mean, you're ultimately going to pay for every, as a state, you're ultimately going to pay for everybody one way or another. You can educate them in the classroom, you can uh, 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 deal with it through uh, if people don't make great health choices and you're going to pay for the care, if, if people get lost in society and, um, and uh, if you look at, for example, criminal justice reform, we, uh, we funded uh, Bard in Prison, this, this documentary, and um, not every, I, I can imagine that, it, you know, I'll get written about for having funded, I think it was funded before I got there, but I'm, I, you know, I own the decisions that came before me. but. Uh, they looked at the level of those who are incarcerated and the level of illiteracy is shocking and the point is the state can either educate that individual or they can pay for that person being incarcerated but one way or another you're going to pay for it and their first choice is less expensive if you were just cold economic dollars and it's a more complete human life which should be something we care deeply about and uh, the effective program that they're running there is that the humanities uh, programs they have, the idea of developing empathy through literature, uh, that it's, it's effective, that um, there's now, this has been going on long enough that we know that recidivism and other things uh, aren't repeated. So I think you have to have a fairly sophisticated conversation about uh, uh, economic impact, um, duty, and uh, there are some legislators that the idea of what is our duty to 
uh, those who elected us to, to those that live around us. Um, that's enough. But um, if somebody believes they're owed uh, an economic argument, I don't disagree with them. If they believe they're owed uh, an intellectual, aesthetic, um, moral argument, we can give them those. Um, I, I'm, I'm not telling you any, you know, I'm not delivering a magic bullet here, but um, I will say that sometimes it's the lens, and uh, since this isn't a, a the way, um, I, I'm trying to think in real time if enough time has passed so I can comment on a congressional decision, but I, I'm going to go ahead and, and do it. Uh, and uh, so when I was working with Chairman Joya that from 2003 to 2008, there was a time when Congressman uh, Taylor uh, 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 of this uh, state was over interior uh, appropriations. And uh, uh, Congressman Charles Taylor, and uh, and uh, he was very fond of uh, Dr. Billington, the Librarian of Congress, and what Dr. Billington was doing. Some incredible projects, and Dr. Billington was a remarkable person. And uh, and President Bush supported our budget, and Laura Bush supported our budget, and she she had an important voice in that city. And uh, the Republicans had the House. And so we needed to see if we could get that increase within the interior. And the com complexity there is uh, we had members, the Republicans, that were in the West, and they needed money for wildfire. We had a, a member who was in Florida, and she was looking at desalination issues in the Everglades. These are, you know, people that are environmentally conscious, and, and they liked us. And uh, the Library of Congress was not under the congressman Taylor's purview. So the conversation evolved that uh, he thought he could do our $10 million increase, but um, did he think if we had such an increase, we could support Dr. Billington's open world project where he brought in Russian thinkers, scholars, scientists? And Chairman Joyce said, well, if this hypothetical $10 million came, we could hypothetically support this wonderful thing with our sister agency, and we got our $10 million, and we signed an MOU with the Library of Congress for half a million dollars. So then Chairman Joyce turned to me, and it would bring in Russian judges, Russian engineers to see how America worked. And we were the arts endowment, so they had to be writers and thinkers. So the jazz group came first and went to New York and Brubeck. They, Brubeck was still with us and wonderful. And then next was writers. So... When I was at, Ch uh, at Ole Miss, all these Fulbrights kept coming there because if you're a Tolstoy fanatic or, or a Russian, you go to, to Ole Miss because that's Faulkner's home. So I called Bill Ferris. This is probably the thing that I don't even know anybody in the room knows Bill is. So we, we called Bill and we said, we need places for all these great young Russian writers and literary critics to come. They'll go to New York first and they can go to any other campus in the world. How about here? So he makes that happen and then I took the next group I think to Ole Miss and that's an example where I believe in international exchange um, I believe we believed in the Library of Congress you're willing to have a conversation to advance the institution's goals uh, and and um, in this case uh, to be cognizant of some of the desires of member of Congress and so uh, we just found it was good to be in the room and, and to be listening and uh, Bill had an approach with Jesse Helms that, that worked a lot, that others might not have had. Uh, we, we worked with, with Congressman Taylor, but I'll tell you this, so once we did that together, so then he got to know Chairman Joy a little better. And this is important, then we went to Asheville where he, it was in his district, and there were a hundred and something nonprofits that came. And the Congressman was seeing somebody that he knew as his friend from, let's say, the bank. And why are you here? Well, I'm here because I'm on the opera board. Well, why are you here? Well, because my wife's uh, at the art museum. <coughs> and all of a sudden, the people he saw as one lens, lawyers, bankers, doctors, whatever, he saw opera, ballet, what have you, same people. And so I, I've always thought that I owe a legislator uh, uh, the respect of looking at their interest and, uh, and seeing where it aligns up with us. And, uh, and, and over time, it, it, it matters. But if we say in the humanities, 
oh, this isn't, you know, these people think this way, they're not ours, if, if they're close-minded, you know, you know, people say, I helped today, I tweeted against something, and I'll say, did you call the Career Center and help some grad student? That's, you want to keep the humanities alive? Um, you know, I say if I have eight extra hours on a campus, I would meet with admissions counselors. They're between ages of 22 and 26. They don't know the liberal arts are going to change their life because they haven't reached that age. Mm -hmm. And I would tell them that, uh, that, for example, when they talk about STEM all the time, that if you ever want to get somebody in med school, uh, music has the highest level of acceptance. But for the larger fields of study, it's English, and it's been since I was an English major. Uh, you, you, in second, I would talk to the career counselors. Um, so in some ways, I think in higher education, we often talk to ourselves, we're often inward turned, and I would spend a lot more time about the public humanities. So you ask something vital, and, um, and sometimes you just lose the battle. And I'd be naive if I didn't say that too. Uh, but, um, and I don't love the metaphor of battles and wars and what have you, but uh, you, you lose the day, and you didn't win with that person. And I tell you, I, I, we had a member of Congress I was once working with when I was running veterans projects, and this member had voted for the elimination of the agency, but we're down in Florida, and in, in district, and we're working with veterans, and this member came, and he so liked what we were doing with veterans, this was again at, a, not this endowment, but at the arts endowment, that uh, for the rest of that member's time, he would not write a reference for anybody getting a U.S. Military Service Academy unless they'd done an oral history and sent it to the Veterans History Project Library of Congress, <laughs> which I would love, you know, all 535 members to have that. So, again, I didn't, the conversation with him was not to be our budget. It was to say the value of our endeavor. And, and he leaned in and he owned that idea in a way that had not even occurred to us. Um, so, uh, so, you know, I, I, I'm an optimist on, on these things. Uh, I won't bore you with a speech, but I have something on optimism that ends with a long <laughs> quote from Niebuhr. And, uh, and, uh, and what Niebuhr said, you know, the great, y'all know Reinhold Niebuhr. Niebuhr, uh, the scholar, was <coughs> looking at his work between the wars, and he said um, that he's a penultimate pessimist, <laughs> but an ultimate optimist. And here's what I'll say. Every grant maker at heart is an ultimate optimist, period. Mm -hmm. There is no other kind that, that should be in the business of grant making. Mm -hmm. no. yeah. Yeah. Lloyd. Um, I want, thank you very much for this very interesting conversation. I want to pose a problem about the South that we're struggling with here in North Carolina and mm -hmm. how the public humanities can help us deal with it. It has to do with the competing views of Confederate monuments and how, I just want to take that as a test case. If you were to hear a proposal, how could the humanities help us in North Carolina <coughs> help people from very different perspectives come to a, a meeting of the mind or at least a respect about an issue like that? It's not abstract, it's very <coughs> visceral. Sure. What would, the human, what would the public humanities events and projects look like? Do you, Bill, do you want to start? Uh, do you want to start? Yeah, I, I think it would be very simple. Uh, <laughs> I think I would have black voices. Uh, and I can, it would be very hard to imagine a black voice that would not say, I feel offended, threatened, whatever. Uh, I do banking at Wells Fargo and the, the banker there was black when the discussion of Silent Sam was going on. He said, he's from Pittsburgh, he said, every time I walk out on the street, I'm upset that I have to look across the street at a symbol of slavery because my people were slaves. I mean, it's not about these stories. It's about heritage, not this, not that. It's not for him. It's very clear. My people were enslaved, and here is a statue celebrating <coughs> slavery. Uh, it'd be very hard with that voice on a platform, and you could give anyone else 
you know, who'd want to take another view. But a public discussion is going to very quickly get to the root of the issue, which is we're in the 21st century. That was in the 19th century. And that battle is over. Our battle is to raise all people and educate them so that we won't have the expense of health care and incarceration. Uh, but I, I think we, we are a long ways from having equal voices in these discussions. We discuss it among ourselves as white folk, but the black voices are not there. And if you introduce uh, black voices in this discussion, it very quickly will be resolved and clarified. Uh, the, the comparison would be having a similar discussion in Germany over a swastika and saying, oh, it's not about, you know, the Third Reich, it's, a, it's an old Teutonic symbol. Well, it's not that way for Jews whose families were exterminated. So these are issues that a, a public discussion could quickly, I think, move to closure if we allowed that to happen. John mentioned the Department of the Interior. I'll just go back real quickly to this uh, uh, issue of a minister of culture at the cabinet level. Because all the cultural endowments have their budget in the Department of Interior. And every year, it's a question, well, we've got all these forest fires out west. We've got to put those out. So that will trump preservation of books and the things that the arts and humanities deal with. We've got to raise, and maybe sometime in the 21st century, those budgets will be liberated. And at the cabinet level, you argue for budgets, for defense, for education, for things that matter. And culture should matter. It should have equal, and maybe we would start with 150 million, but if it's at that level, it will quickly rise to a level that uh, it would be an embarrassment not to fund these agencies mm -hmm. along with the Defense Department and other agencies. So that, that was my argument. But the Interior Department took me back because we were always fighting forest fires was, you know, or floods. Uh, all those things eat at the fringes of the, the budgets. I, th I think I didn't phrase my question clearly initially. What I was asking about was, is, the, is there a significant or could there be a much more significant philanthropic contribution to the NEH so that the federal part is insignificant or is at least then yeah. shamed into jumping up to what we all think it should be? Uh, thank you. Uh, I think it's much more likely I, I, I didn't uh, uh, hear, hear it right. Thank you for clarifying that. I, uh, certainly that conversation uh, happened there. Uh, we're, we have the executive director of the National Trust for the Humanities here with you. Great to see you, Annalisa. And, and some of the establishment that initially was a, a, a previous chairman thinking, well, we need to backstop this idea of the federal investment doesn't happen. Um, the reality is I personally um, don't know if that's where the solution is. So the National Park Service, of course, has a foundation, uh, mm -hmm. uh, archives. We're, we're limited in how we can use appropriated dollars for even activities and events. Um, we had the Jefferson Lecture, but we can't use appropriated dollars to, to take care of some of the you know, costs that bring you people in or what have you. So we'll always have a need for hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars for some activities. But uh, at $155 million our budget, uh, normal endowment, you're allowed to draw about 45 to 5% off a corpus, you know, the, the body of it, if it's invested in, in the market. And so, uh, you know, a billion dollars gives you $45 million. You're talking about having to have three or four billion dollars. Mm -hmm. And then I think the worry is you start to be in competition with the groups you fund. So you run a small museum, 
and you're asking f money from the local donor, but I can fly in and I can say I can get you to the White House. I can, you know, I, you know, um, our we have to watch that at the uh, Verizon funded the NEA uh, NEA Jazz Masters concerts and other things, but we had to watch the idea that we were competing uh, with some of our own grantees, and again, we had a just the level of access we have in Washington changed, um, you know, it's a little unfair. And so, and I think uh, the everyday citizen, that $5, you know, $100, whatever, their, their point of view is we already pay the federal government. And, and so I, I don't know if that would be the solution. I would probably, if we're talking in the billions, encourage those individuals or corporate leaders and foundations to go through other existing channels to advance the support of the humanities. Um, that, that's my perspective, uh, uh, just because it would take such a remarkable amount. I mean, that's the odd thing. So our name, we have no endowment, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a, you know, uh, a peculiarness, uh, uh, but, um, but we do have, you know, we have people that leave us things in their wills and stuff uh, that allows us to pay for interns and some other things. Uh, and, uh, and I'm actually trying to bring a little order to those, those funds. Uh, uh, yes, Bill, that's you. Yes, yeah, yeah. Just speaking to the question, um, I think it's really important to remember that the NEH uh, provides seed money. Mm -hmm. so, so instead of competing with other humanities organizations and, and nonprofits around the country. What the NEH does is provide seed money. So when when Bill generously mentioned North Carolina, I'm sorry, North American Slave Narratives, the <coughs> website that I did with the uh, with the UNC Library, which really did all the heavy lifting, um, we started out with $120,000 from the NEH, and then the library started talking to various private uh, entities that saw that as an endorsement of our project. Mm -hmm. and, and now, of course, the same thing happens with the North Carolina Humanities Council. We, we invest in projects, and we can assure every, every uh, person whom we're talking to, including uh, people on Capitol Hill, that one dollar of our money, which is, of course, also partly your money, is going to generate between two and four dollars of private money. Yeah. So, the, so the key thing, I think, is to think about the NEH as, a, as the, the seed for the generation, the blossoming of private dollars beyond that. Absolutely. I mean, that's that catalytic role. And that's the side of me that I might say, you can call it whatever you want, you can call it physically conservative if you want, but the idea that we want to invest in something, we don't want to own it, so to speak. And uh, if there's, we want to, often we're funding something that the community is not there yet. And once we give our stamp of approval, yeah. all the other organizations, foundations, even to the level of Mellon, they know that you have cleared, when you're funded by the endowment, the most discerning, comprehensive, and transparent level of approval you can get in this nation, period, in our fields. And so, by its very nature, if we fund 100% of something, that means we're going to fund so many fewer organizations. So, so we want to be catalytic. We have certain projects, again, presidential papers that we've done for decades. Um, and, uh, and, and that makes sense, but even there, our overall dollar is a modest amount uh, versus the institution's investment. Uh, so I, I'm so glad you talked about us being there on the front end. The one thing, you know, when people ask me, uh, you know, uh, I won't go into questions in the, you know, the, the, the confirmation process, but I'll just say in general, because I think I've said it in public <coughs> settings, is when people ask me if I'm worried about controversy, I think that's the wrong question. I'm worried about mediocrity. Mm -hmm. The idea of, you know, you can do this, you're not going to get in trouble, it's not going to transform anything, but you can do it. And, and the idea is we want to make real change. Uh, we want to be, you know, when I go to meetings, you know, I, you know, I see the dreamers and the vision at people at NASA. I see it even in a very different way at DARPA or whatever. Uh, 
you know, I, I saw, you know, veterans that are trying to think of a safer way to, to conduct themselves in, in hostile environments, and I want the humanities to bring their wisdom to the table, too, at the same level. And so, uh, we always want to be investing on, on, on that idea of what's new, and not, again, abandon those long-term projects. Um, we are saying, however, to those long-term projects, that if you project out your presidential papers as always being books between covers, then you're missing a younger generation. Um, we are talking to university presses about the monograph. It, the idea that public libraries are going to continue, you know, the, they're not, in my day when I was a book editor, they would buy a thousand <coughs> copies, now they might buy a hundred. You know, you have to uh, adjust and, uh, and there's flexibility in that. Um, conversation about open source, and, and dissemination of knowledge more completely. And that removes a lot of economic barriers. Um, and, you know, when somebody says, I love the great old days of university presses, you know, we sold a thousand copies of books at $79. We're from a part of the world, and I think you are too, where a lot of people don't have $79 for that book. Uh, and can't drive to the library, and the library doesn't keep the hours they have. And on the other hand, had the federal government invest in open source educational materials like we have at excitement that two and a half million educators use a year that's something i love and that's a part of the endowment that was year after year to your question so it was funded through verizon and then worldcom mci you know all these companies verizon still around but several of the other funders weren't so i noted to congress but we didn't ask for a special set aside we're just creating room in our budget with this we've had about uh, 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 since FY17, more than a $7 million increase in our budget, where they had the largest budget we've had since FY10. And what have we been able to do? Instead of contract workers we've had for years, we have uh, a new person who's tenure track from Ohio State, uh, who taught geography, won Teacher of the Year awards, and he's going through the entire excitement side. And we're going to talk about sequential learning in civics and what does that look like. And we're going to tie it into our focus on the 250th anniversary. So, uh, and every one of those materials are free. And I can tell you when I talked about being at Crow Agency Reservation or earlier when I alluded to that, and I was in the Badlands of South Dakota for about a week uh, with my colleague Vincent and with the Lakota and Dakota. And you go, of course, through extraordinary patches of time without any phone or internet access. So that means our old website, like if, if Bill had something great and we'd have something on Southern history and then we would go out to one of his books and then we'd bring you back in and we'd go out to something else, all these links. Well, that assumes that you always have internet access. And when I'm on a tribal college and the parents are around the library trying to get the Wi-Fi to FaceTime their deployed children, then you get the idea that I'll just use your quote for fair use. We'll have it on the website. So we're, I mean, we're going through tens of thousands of links to repackage this so you can just push print and you have your educational materials where, regardless of where you are. You have an Appalachian part of this state where it's going to have the same issues that I'm dealing with in the West. So we're just trying to spend a lot of time, you know, I hate to, uh, to, to talk about it in such kind of, mundane ways, but we're looking at it as a business. Is this the way you deliver knowledge to people? And, um, and if not, let's change it. And so we're just spending a lot of time saying what does 21st century education look like? All of which is in continuity with the chairman that have come before. And uh, building on and even stealing some of the ideas that came before. You know. Can we do one more question? That one. Yes. We talked a lot about education. Yes. And um, we're working on a documentary on Rosenwald School. Yes. Uh, that Bill was helping us with. Uh, and it, it seems to me that there's such an interconnection there. Uh, the schools provided a community, which is humanities, but they also provided the education. And what will, it's sort of a chicken egg kind of thing. What's, what is First, what happens in that process is is education creating their thirst for togetherness, and uh, or is that innate in us? That just I, I haven't solved that in my head. <laughs>
Oh, you know, I'm probably with Picasso on that one. I believe it's almost always in us, and it's the living of life that sometimes works it out of us. I believe we all love music, we love to dance, we love to draw, we love words. Um, the acquisition of language by a child, I think, is just one of the most remarkable things. And um, I think all, in some ways, we're called to try to hold on to that as long as we can. Um, I, um, uh, you know, so uh, Robert Penn Warren, uh, uh, I knew people as the books I read. Bill had the advantage of teaching with uh, Red Warren at, at Yale. Uh, uh, and, and knowing him, Robert Penn Warren at the end of that poem, Audubon, uh, sometimes it's published as Tell Me a Story. And at the end of that poem, he says, uh, Tell me a story in this time and place of mania. Tell me a story of deep delight. And uh, I think that's always been in us. And if, if you may allow, um, it's rare in life in a public setting you get to thank somebody who's, who's transformed your life. But, but again, I at many turns didn't know what I was going to be. Uh, the same resume that's talked about so kindly here. Uh, at the time in living it, it felt like a dilettante, you know. Uh, I would do this job for three years and n never my life was the same job twice. And, uh, and you have self-doubt. Um, people believe in you. Uh, Bill Ferris, I had finished grad school. I was probably still 23, about to be 24, maybe something. And uh, needed a job, was writing for a lot of magazines, not, not really making a living. And Mercer University Press had an advertisement for a history PhD or an English PhD or what have you to start back Southern literature programming. And I told Bill, and I said, it's a shame, you know, I don't have a doctorate. And, uh, and Bill said, no, 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 you can tell him that you did history PhD, you know, with history and the English. He could, you know, exactly what he created. And so I told him, as an editor, you want a generalist. And, uh, and I ultimately got an interview. What I didn't know is he was being confirmed on the Hill when they still had, you know, hearings and such. And he called and gave a reference. <laughs> and uh, I got, I, so I got that job, my first job. And... Uh, we we're sharing space with a publishing house, and when the uh, woman turned toward me, I thought, my goodness, what, this, is, this is an extraordinary person. By the time we had a first conversation, we'd been married 23 years, and they said, you need to go meet the visiting writer. I was the lowest person on totem poles, so I had to go to the airport and bring, you know, toilet paper if the visiting writer ran out or toilet paper, whatever you had to do. And I'm going to the airport reading, does he say his name, Joya or Goya or whatever? And so Bill uh, gave me my, my career, my wife, and my mentor. It's not a, not a bad thing to do to someone, I think. Um, but most importantly, he stayed in touch. And I must say, this kind of flowering of book after book in these last years, uh, there's about 10 years he probably didn't have a book because he invested in my life. And I could line up a hundred other people and you say, oh, that's the month he didn't get a book out because he invested in my life. And we could just go down and we all uh, uh, stay in touch in that way. So, Bill, thank you. Thank you. You get the last word. You get the last word. It's breathtaking to hear how John so elegantly and eloquently moves from topic to topic. And I think one thing we can all agree on is that the humanities are in very good hands and we are really honored that he's taken a day to be at Carolina with his distinguished staff and to see what we do, and we have a much better idea of how to work with the NEH. Uh, John, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for being here. You are the very best. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.